good morning. How's everybody this morning? That was weak. That was yeah. That was weak. How's everybody this morning? Great. Yeah, that was still not great, but we'll take it. No, <laughs> we're so glad to have you all here today. Wait, man, this is the best crowd we've had post post in the middle of Woo. COVID. I don't know how to do that, so yes. So everybody stand this morning. We are going to start out. Hopefully, these songs go a little bit better than they did last week. They can't go much worse. <laughs> not, knock on wood, but uh, we are going to praise the Lord, and we are going to have a good time doing it. Amen. Amen. All right. What a glorious night. This is talks about the birth of Jesus, and you know what? How many of you know we can talk about the birth of Jesus more than just in December? Amen. Amen. All right. What a glorious night. singing not, not so much i don't know if we have any monitors up here all right our next song is even if 
And uh, <coughs> I think Grant's going to sing this song today. Uh, we help, us, it help us start it out. But even if all things go wrong, even if you don't feel like God is with you, we know he is. Amen. All right. Join us as we sing Even If. Thank you. 
You may be seated. Amen. God is good, right? All right. All right. There we go. That's exactly right. You know, it, if you look out and you see just how amazing and sunny it is, oh, I love days like that. Now, I don't know about you. I'd rather sweat as I would freeze. Now, let's just get divided really quick, all right? If you're a hot person and you like the hot weather, raise your hand right now. Oh, there's like five of us. If you're a cold person, raise your hand right now. All right, majority wins. All right. Oh, I tell you. you and know, a blank. <laughs> oh, you know, I, I want to say this really quick. You know, what we were singing today, God is in control. Amen. Amen. No matter what disarray the world is in, God is still in control. And we've just got to cling to that. We've got to know that. Yesterday, my wife, Christy, and I, we was able to spend a little time with our, uh, one of our kids and uh, our grandchild. You know, and as I was walking around, we went down to Dogwood Canyon. It was like a little nature place. And we went down there and was walking around. And as I watched him interact with his wife and his son, our grandson, it, it's, it's amazing because I remember all the prayers I prayed for him when he was little and wasn't with me and all the prayers I prayed as he took off uh, when he was 16 years old, when I would, couldn't be there with him, you know. And, and um, man, God is good. It's the culmination of all those prayers answered right there. And uh, I just thank God for everything. And it's just so, my, my reason for saying this is, is never give up on those prayers. Keep praying for those people that God put on your heart. Keep praying for those people that you have no control over because God is there and he is still in control. He's still in control of everything. We've just got to trust him and thank him for that. Um, we're going to go ahead and have our ushers come. And as they come, I'd like to make one really quick announcement. If you're a guy and you've never been to one of our men's discipleship groups, I'm going to put this guy on the spot really quick. This guy right here, come here, Buster. I totally you put him on the spot. He leads them, and he does a really good job. I truly believe this is one of his ministries. And uh, so if you've not been to a men's D group meeting, it's next Saturday, 8 o'clock. At the fellowship hall, last time we did it over the uh, Zoom meeting, and we are going to take our chance, and we're going to do it in person. No, we're not taking a chance. But no, uh, that's what we're going to do. So next you, Saturday what, at 8 o'clock. What are you calling it now? What? It's what Men you, in the Way. Oh, but I thought you said It's men's, a discipleship group. Oh, men's D group. Discipleship okay. group. Sorry. Right. I never heard that term. So men's oh. D group is men's disciple. Men, men in the oh, Way. Men in the Way. It's, men in okay. the Way, yes. It's a discipleship group. Sorry. I was trying to be hip and cool. Did it work? I was like, yeah. <laughs> All right. We, we better pray this one out right now. Here we go. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we just love you and we praise you. God, we're just so blessed that we can gather together. I ask that you take this offering, Father, and that you bless it to your needs, Lord, that you get the glory, the honor, and the praise from everything. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. After you give your offering, stand with us as we sing the blessing.
Bible, may His favor. May His favor be upon you in a thousand generations. In your family, in your children, in their children, and their children. May His favor be upon you in a thousand generations. And your family, and your children, and their children, and their children. May His presence go before you, and behind you, and beside you, all around you, and within you. He is with you, He is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your car. for us, Lord, and it's for our children, and it's for their children, and it's for every day, every morning, and every evening, Lord, that you have your blessings for us, Lord, and that that is what you want for us, Lord. We just ask that you be with the service today as Pastor brings the word, Lord, about going and telling others, Lord, that, that not only that we will be your disciples, Lord, but so we can bring others to you, Lord. We just thank you for all these things, and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is almost a first. We have people sitting in the front row. <laughs> you know, I don't care what church you go to, what denomination you go to, nobody wants to sit up front, do they? They're always like, I like the back, right? <laughs> it's great. God is so good, though. We're so blessed to have each and every one of you with us today. Um, I always like to start my uh, sermons off with a little humor, so hang with me. Uh, I've been told I've got dad jokes, and I do all day long. A pastor that was new to his congregation was in a small town in a small city. He was able to drive and visit his parishioners with a bicycle. So he's riding along, and all of a sudden he sees a young boy with a lawnmower. He thinks to himself, you know what? This town is small enough. I could probably just walk everywhere I needed to go because I need a mower for my yard. So he goes up to the little boy, and he says, uh, how much you want for your mower? He says, well... I don't know, sir, sir. I'm just trying to get a new bicycle. The pastor thought. He said, well, I tell you what. He goes, I've got a bicycle. I need a mower. Would you want to trade? He said, I tell you what. Can I take it for a, for a spin real quick and see if it fits me? Pastor, or the pastor says, sure. Yeah, that'd be great. So the little boy takes off on it. He's riding it around. And as the pastor is watching this boy take off on his bike, he says, I probably should try to start this mower and make sure it works. So he cranks on it a time or two, and he turns the gas on and off, and he's pumping the little bulb on the side, and he just can't get it going for whatever reason. Little boy comes back and er, slides in and says, I'll take it, Pastor. This bike is everything I need. He said, well, that's great, but I'm having a problem starting this mower up. The boy says, oh, that's easy. You just got to cuss at it. <laughs> the pastor says, excuse me, I got to cuss at it. He goes, well, I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for 30 years. I don't even remember how to cuss. The boy said, keep cranking on it. It'll come right back to you. 
So I appreciate that. That's some good response. God is good. But I, but I mean, I think we all would agree, walking the Christian walk is not easy, right? Even as a pastor, it's hard for all of us. We just try to do our very best to get through the day. Now, if you're here for the first time, or, or maybe you've been here for a few visits, we are three and a half years young. We're going to be four years old as a church, if you will, uh, September 11th of this year. So we've done a lot of growing, if you will. We've done a lot of maturing, not only as individuals, but as a church. When we first started, we was at the VFW in Ozark, and we was putting chairs up and then taking them down after the service. Randy and Sherry, that come to their first service and lead the music, they would haul in keyboards and uh, hymnals, all kinds of stuff. We would bring them in and then set up church and then take them down and, and uh, go back home. And I remember praying to God, God, please, give us a place that we can call our own, that I can just leave everything there and we don't have to haul everything back and forth. God blessed us with what we thought was going to be one office area, well, it ended up being four. And God is just so gracious. And through many of you sitting here today, not only through your tithes and offerings, but through your man and women skills, we was able to make this into our little church for now. So we are growing as a church, but more importantly, we're growing as individuals. And I can see it so much in, in many of us and you all because it's great when you start seeing things on social media being shared in the light of crazy times, that's growth in the Lord. Amen? When you start to see things take place in a dark world when we're in the midst of, that's growth in the Lord. And we're not done growing. You know, as Christians, we never stop growing. Amen? We continually grow and we grow and grow. And that's the great thing about the Lord is because we can never know enough. We can never grow enough when it comes to our God. Now, as a pastor, as a former corporate person, if you will, in corporate America, I'm always analyzing not only myself and my effectiveness, but our church and what we're doing. And one area that I know we can grow is in discipleship. And it's not only this church, it's every church out there. We all can grow as disciples. We all can be better disciples. Now, if you look at the word disciple, and, and you know where I'm going today is to simply tell someone it's a great commission given to us by Jesus. But he tells us a few things. He tells us, number one, and, and I'm going to jump ahead, but not really, so hang there. He tells us to go tell others, to make disciples, and then to teach. And doesn't that freak you out sometimes, especially if you're a young, growing Christian? Well, what, what do you mean? I've got to go somewhere? Yeah. Sometimes people go all the way to China and Africa and the Philippines. Sometimes people just keep on going through Ozark or Springfield. But that's different for all of us, right? We all have a different circle of influence. We all impact different people. That's what makes us great. That's what makes us a church. I read somewhere where, you know, uh, introverts need other introverts to know about Jesus. Extroverts need other extroverts to know about them, right? We all have our qualities. We all have our specialties, if you will, when it comes to talking about the Lord. Now, the word disciple comes from the Greek word mathetaeus. Mathetaeus, and what that means is a pupil or an apprentice, all right? I, and I like the apprentice part of it because we all know what an apprentice is, right? If you've ever worked construction and of any type, typically there are apprentices and then they become journeymen and all this, right? We're never going to be masters as Jesus was, right? We're, we're always going to be learning and growing in our craft, if you will. But we are apprentices. Now, I'm an 80s person, and excuse me for always using 80s references, but how many here have seen Star Wars? All right, good deal. More than my first service. That's great. <laughs> so we know what a Padawan is, right? We know you've got a Jedi master, and then you've got their Padawans, which are their apprentices, if you will. Now, I think when we hear the term discipleship, we kind of think we've got to be a Jedi master, right? We've got to be honed in every area of our craft. We hold the Bible like a two-edged sword, like a lightsaber, right? We try to swing it around. Of course not. We're never going to know all the Bible has to know, right? We're never going to be able to pray the most perfect prayers. We're always just learning and growing and do the best we can. However, we do have a job as Christ commands us, and we're going to see that in just a minute, to be like him. Now, if you take the word Christian, right? And I think if I was to ask many of us here today, we would raise our hands that have accepted Christ as our Savior, that we are Christians. Now, that comes from the Greek word Christianos, which means little Christs, little Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't feel like a little Christ, right? 
I'm, I'm a human being and I'm flawed and I have many flaws, but I do my best. I, I, I shake the dirt off and get up and keep trying. See, that's the difference. We just want to keep trying. We ask God to forgive us where we falter and we just keep on trying. We keep on trying to be like Jesus as much as we can. But I think we look at this word discipleship like it's a bad word. Think back to when you had little kids or maybe you as a little kid yourself. When you tell them something, they don't want to hear it, what do they do? They close their eyes and they go, num, 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 right? They make funny faces. I think when we get to that part in the Bible, we do that sometimes. We just kind of ignore it. Discipleship, well, I don't know enough. Discipleship, what do you mean? I, I'm not a master yet. Well, discipleship, I can't teach. Perfectly today, when you leave here today, you're going to know you don't have to know everything. Today, when you leave here, hopefully you'll understand and know that all you've got to do is simply go and tell someone. It's all God's asking us to do. And more importantly, it's what Christ has commanded us to do, is simply go and tell someone. My sermon in a sentence, and again, if you're new here, I typically like to wrap things up in one simple sentence. Today's, like I said, was easy. Go and tell someone. Now, why do you do that? Because here's the deal. You're not going to remember everything that was said. Most importantly, I pray you remember what the Bible says, because that's the most important thing. Not what I say, but what God says, because his word is perfect and his word is true. Now, before we go to, the, to uh, read God's word, if you would join me in prayer, we'll ask his blessing on this message. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your written word. I thank you for each and every person that chose to worship here today. Lord, my prayer is that where there is specific needs, that you are going to meet those needs. In faith, God, I'm going to thank you for meeting them. Where there's physical needs, Lord, I just pray that you touch them. Where there's emotional needs, Lord, I just pray that you comfort them. Where there's financial needs, I ask that you bless them, God. Father, I ask that you empty me of me and that the words I speak be yours and yours alone. And Father, may you be glorified and lifted up on high. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So if you've got your Bibles, please turn to Matthew. Matthew, if you don't, don't worry, I'll have them up on the board. But Matthew, if you've brought them and, and, and maybe you're not sure where to go, it's the very first book of the New Testament, all right, or the New Agreement. Matthew, very first one. We're going to be in chapter 28 and reading just a few short verses, 16 through 20. Now, as you turn there, I want to set it up. I want to, I want to do our homework, if you will, because we've got to know about these things contextually. So what we're doing, we're picking up right after Christ was resurrected. Now, we typically hear about the resurrection of Christ during Easter, right? We, we know that's what we celebrate. For us as Christians, that's the Super Bowl, if you will, right? That's the whole reason we are able to exist is because of his resurrection, and we're so thankful for that. So we, again, we know that at his resurrection, the earth shook and the stone was rolled away. Could you imagine being there? Man, I mean, I just could not imagine it. Now, Matthew, I love what Matthew says if you read the preceding verses. He says the guards fainted deeply. Now, think about that. They passed out, all right? They were sitting there guarding what they thought was a dead body, and they passed out when that stone was rolled away, and there was Jesus. Could you imagine? Now, what they did afterwards, because they were so freaked out, they ran back to Israel, Jerusalem, and they told the Jewish leaders, they said, then this guy we was guarding, he's not there. That stone is rolled away, and, and he, it, it, he appeared to us. And they told him that something. They said, no, that's not what happened. What happened was his disciples came and got him and took that body away. That's, that's what we're going with. Now, the sad part about that is Jewish people still to this day that don't believe in Christ believe, and that's the story they stick with. Now, we as Christians, as Christ followers, as Christianoses, little Christ, we believe and know that Jesus is resurrected. Amen? Amen. Now, I thought we could do better than that. Jesus is resurrected. Amen? Amen. There we go. Let's get some gumption in here. There we go. <laughs> but uh, no, he's raised, and then we know the Mary's seen Jesus, and they talked with him. Then we know that Jesus was reunited with the disciples, and then he gave them something to do. He says, I want you to go to Galilee. I want you to meet me on a mountain. Now, many Bible scholars believe it was Mount Tabor where they went to, to see Jesus because Jesus has something very important to give them. He has a command, if you will. 
Let's pick up in chapter 16. It says, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now think about that for just a minute. These are men that walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus for three years. And some of them doubted. It's pretty profound, isn't it? They knew Jesus. They knew him personally for three years and some change. They walked with him, talked with him. Yet some of them doubted. Jesus says, I have been given all authority on heaven and on earth. And I command you, I, I'm sending you out to go to make disciples and to teach. Go Make disciples and teach. Now, we're going to take these three commands that was given to the disciples because, can I tell you something? It doesn't just apply to them. You realize that, right? That's us too. We're to go, we're to make disciples, and we're to teach. Now, you're probably sitting there, oh my goodness, I can't get through step one. And I get that. It's hard to tell someone about Jesus, amen? It can be very intimidating to talk about the Lord, but it shouldn't be. So, so today, we're going to take these three things, and we're going to chop them up like the Karate Kid. Oh, yeah. All right, another 80s reference. There you go. You guys are laughing. And we're going to cut them up into two sermons. We're going to talk today about telling someone next weekend. I know it's Father's Day, but we're going to talk about making disciples and teaching. Is that okay? Because I believe that we as a church, more importantly as individuals, when we're out in the trenches all day long, Seven days a week. That's when we put what we learn into action. Amen? That's when we have got to know what to do, what to say, and where to go. I would love to see some of us here in this church today, whether it's first or second service, turn into missionaries. Now, if you don't think about sacrifice, talk to a missionary. Now, I mean a real missionary, one that lives in the jungle, one that is in the trenches day in and day out, that is praying to God for uh, his uh, supply of, of their needs, whether it be um, rice. We, we have some very dear friends of ours that are missionaries to the Philippines, and they're not recreational missionaries. They are in the trenches 10 months a year. We also know some other missionaries that are missionaries that are out in the field three months a year and home nine. When we go, we don't just go and sit there, do we? We've got to know what to say. We've got to tell someone something. And this is what I love about it. Jesus doesn't just tell us to do things and not give us reassurances. The last part of this, he says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We know as Christians that when we accept Christ as Savior, we are given the Holy Spirit that indwells with us, that helps us to get through those tough times, that will give us the courage that we need, that will strengthen us in that time of need. One of my favorite life verses is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. doesn't mean I can go pick a car up because I'm quoting that verse, right? It means that when I'm in that situation where I am praying that God will make me bold to be able to witness to someone that Christ, through the Holy Spirit, will give me the strength that I need. God gives us everything we need to do this. So again, we are going to go make disciples and teach in the next few weeks. And, and again, it's not just for preachers and teachers. We understand that, right? It's for all of us that call Christ our Savior. We are to go make disciples and teach teach. We are to tell someone about the Lord. Now, I think sometimes we've muddied the waters when it comes to discipleship. We've muddied it because it seems so mystical, if you will. It seems like it's so hard. It's not. It's simply living the life that Jesus sent us to live. We have been commissioned, meaning sent out with a purpose. Now, many of us have probably became Christians at a young age. And when we do, it's amazing and wonderful, and I love it when there's, you know, young children come to the Lord. But we grow up in society, and what happens? Life happens, right? 
You get a job, you get bills. We start working for the weekend, don't we? Monday comes and you can't wait till Friday. Let's be honest, we're all there. Monday comes and you're just like, I can't wait. We base much of our existence on those Saturdays and Sundays as well. I can't wait to do this with the family on Saturday. I can't wait to do this after church on Sunday. Can I tell you something? What would life be like if we just took one day at a time? And we took Monday for Monday and we tried to do all that God wanted us to do on Monday. And then we took Tuesday and did all that God wanted us to do. And then I think sometimes in the midst of the craziness of life, we, we rephrase things of, well, I've got to go to church on Sunday, then I can come over to the barbecue. Got to go to church on Wednesday, but then I can come over Thursday, right? See, we get to go to church on Sunday. We get to go to church on Wednesday. And, and, and I don't know many of you, I, I know I talked to one lady today, and she said, I'm just so excited to be in church today. It's my first time. I, Amen. I'm right there with you. We have been through some scary times. And, and, and I love seeing faces in here. You talk about hard as a preacher. It was hard preaching to the band. <laughs> That's all I had. I had like five people, you know. They're like, we've heard it before, Pastor. Yes, right? So it's great to have you. I never want to take you all for, for, uh, for thank you. Granted again, I'm losing it. But I think we all would agree when it comes to living the Christian life, we struggle. We have a hard time. Sometimes we pray for God to use us, and we're not quite sure when that time comes, don't we? Reminds me of a story of a, of a Christian who was growing in the Lord, and he wanted to be used by God. He woke up one morning, he said, God, use me today. Send me someone that I can witness to. So he rode the bus to work every day, and as he's riding the, the bus, uh, uh, no, nobody else on this bus, this big buff guy walks in and sits right next to him. He's very intimidating. I mean, he's just, you know, very muscular and just, uh, the guy's thinking, all these seats and he's sat next to me, right? As the bus continued to go, to, to go towards their last stop, the big buff guy started to cry. Then he turns to the young man sitting next to him and says, I just want to know Jesus. I just want to know more about the Lord. And he's crying. This young Christian guy starts putting his head down. And he goes, all right, God, I prayed for a sign. Is this the sign you want me to talk to you about? I mean, right? We get like that, don't we? we? We ask for these things. God puts them in our life. And then we're like, are you sure? We start backpedaling. It scares us, right? I mean, we just, whoo, it can be scary. But one of the hardest things we can do as a growing Christian is witness to others. It's so hard to witness to others. We're worried about lots of things. Rejection, number one. We're worried that somebody may think we're weird, number two. But I think more importantly, many times we feel unqualified, we feel unequal, and we definitely feel unworthy to talk about the Lord. Whatever it is, whatever excuse we give ourselves, we need to know and understand it's just simple. We just got to tell someone about the Lord. When Christy and I really started getting serious about God, and, and I've told many of you my story, and, and I've probably heard this before, so I'm going to repeat myself, but it, it fits perfectly with this. When, when we grow in the Lord, we, we pray bold prayers sometimes, don't we? Well, I remember we was growing in the Lord, and we was living in the Kansas City area at the time. We was living in Topeka, Kansas. And uh, I remember, again, we've had, we had many financial problems and things, and I remember as I pulled into the Walmart parking lot, seeing this young couple that were there, it was a mother and uh, like two or three kids. They had a sign up that said, you know, we need money for gas. I remember praying, all right, Lord, if there's $5 left or whatever it was on my debit card, after I pay for what I need, I'm going to give it to them. Make me bold. Now, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I doubt there's five extra dollars on my debit card, all right? But I still prayed it, and I thought, all right, God. So I go and I swipe the card or whatever it was, and guess what? There was $5 left. Now I was like, okay, God, it's getting serious. I've actually got to talk to these people. I prayed this big prayer. Now I've got to go talk to them. And so I'm praying all the way out there, and I'm praying. I'm like, God, use me. You, you, I've, I've prayed this prayer. You're bringing them in. Use me, God. They're right there. They're right there. And I'm walking up, and I'm nervous as all, can, as all get out. I'm shaking. My hands are sweating. I, I'm, I'm just, and I take this $5 out, and this little boy comes to get it. And I said, do you know Jesus? He looks at me and he's like, yeah, 
takes the five dollars and backs away, you know? I mean, that is probably the worst way to witness to someone. But can I tell you something? That's all I knew at the time. And I believe that God honored that. And hopefully I didn't scare that kid off forever. All right. But, but I meant good. I remember being a, a, a young boy in uh, Bloomington, California, where I grew up at. We was at this grocery store called Stater Brothers, and I'm really taking it back. But I remember checking out. I remember this older man just pacing. And he's pacing back and forth, and I'm thinking, man, something's about to go down. I'm 10 years old, but I knew something was up. And he's pacing. Next thing you know, he stops, and he starts screaming at the top of his lungs, Jesus is coming back soon. You better get right with the Lord. And I'm 10 years old, and I was like this little boy. You know, my eyes are big, and I'm backing up, you know. This guy's a weirdo. Now, in all honesty, and now that I've grown and growing in the Lord, I know he meant good for that, right? We've just got to be careful how we go about it, and that's why it's so important that we know what to say. And I promise you, it's so much easier than what we think it is. It's simply... Talking like we do as friends. Simply having a conversation before start, church starts. That's how we talk about the Lord. Now, for many years before I was a full-time pastor, I was bivocational, and I worked in corporate America. And I remember when they found out I pastored. I was at a meeting in St. Louis, and it was a big deal. And I'm in, in this meeting, and the next thing you know, it just spreads like wildfire. Have you ever seen like a rumor spread in a room and, and you can just see it go. It's kind of like the wave. You know, everybody's at a football game doing the wave, right? You could just see it. And it came back around, and the guy sat next to me said, you're a pastor? I watched it literally wave through the room. And I said, yes, I am. You don't act like a pastor. I didn't know whether to take that as a compliment or, uh, or, or something bad. What he meant later on, I knew, was he told me I act like a regular person. We should reflect Christ in our everyday life. We should be the same that we are. Just because I'm a pastor doesn't make me any better or any different than any of you. We all are on the same course. We all have different circles of influence. And I remember this particular corporation used to like to go to, um, to bars or whatever it was, and then they'd make a big deal. Buddy, we're going here. Is that okay? Sure. Y'all do you. I'm going to do me. Right? I'm going to be me no matter where I'm at and no matter what situation I am. I'm going to be me. But as we gather together, whether it's corporate America, whether it's around the water cooler, wherever it is, it can be difficult to talk about the Lord. And it's a struggle I believe that we all have, especially as we start our growth to get through step one. Go and tell someone. Simply go and tell someone. Now, again, we go to different places. Maybe you're in construction. Well, you go to the construction site. Maybe you go to the office. Well, that's where you're going to go. Right now, let's bring it into context. You're on a Zoom call or a team, Microsoft Teams, right? I guarantee you, you're having a conversation before that meeting starts. We can always sprinkle a little Jesus, like I say, here and there, when it comes to talking about the Lord. What about your neighbor? I guarantee you, you're talking with neighbors, right? You're waving and saying hi. Do they know where you're going on Sundays? Do they know where you're going on Wednesdays or whatever day of the week? More importantly, do they know how you live seven days of the week? Being a disciple just isn't Wednesdays and Sundays. It's every day of our life. It's talking about the Lord. You ever think about that? I guarantee you, if one of you all won the lottery, you'd tell someone, wouldn't you? You bet you would. Not only would you tell someone, you'd show them. <laughs> you'd buy that new car or truck. You'd buy that new house, motorcycle, whatever. We'd, we'd buy some stuff, wouldn't we? Where'd you get the money for that? I won the lottery. Now, maybe you wouldn't, you know, for whatever reasons. I get that too. But when we're excited about something, the point is this. When we're excited about something, we tell others about it, right? Get a smoking hot deal at Harbor Freight. What do you do? Man, I got this for five bucks, right? <laughs> Y'all been there. Maybe you went to... I'm getting them really showing my age. I almost said J.C. Penney's. Are they even in business? Yes. Here we go. T.J. Maxx. Does that work? Yeah. All right. I got a woo. You got a good deal on a purse at T.J. Maxx. That's what I hear about, right? You're going to tell someone, and that's what God wants us to do. That's what this great commission is about. This great commission is simply telling others. And I like what Mark says in chapter 16 and 15. He says, and then he told them, same situation, different point of view. It's Mark talking. 
Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. And you guys are like, you bet. Preach. That means a preacher's got to do it. Whew, takes me off the hook. No, it doesn't. Because look what Matthew said. That's Matthew's viewpoint. Yes, as a preacher, I need to go to the good news. I need to tell others about the good news. But as a Christian, you got to tell them too. It's not just me. Every single one of us have a circle of influence that we can tell someone about Jesus. We all do. You know, and it's sad to say, but the Great Commission, and you've heard this before, has become the Great Omission. Would you agree? The Great Commission has become the Great Omission. Let me give you some statistics. 67%, this is an old statistic too, so it's probably went up. 67% of people in America want to be invited to church or to a church function. 67%. That means out of 10 people, seven of them want to be invited or know something about the Lord. Think about that. That should hopefully give you a little more courage when it comes to talking to others. Seven out of 10. So of 10 people that you talk to or invite to church, man, seven of them statistically is going to come. Three, no. But if you go back to what we looked at, even some of the disciples doubted, right? We know we can't force everybody to come to the Lord as much as we'd like to sometimes, especially when there are friends and our family. Man, we just would love for them to come, wouldn't you? I'd like to just bottle them up like this bottle of water and just say, just drink it. You'll love it, right? But we can't do that. They've got to figure it out for themselves. Now, let's just suppose James 4, 17. You're familiar with this. It is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not to do it. What if, and again, we're using supposition here, we suppose, what if we stood before Jesus and he asked you, do you realize how many people you could have led to the Lord if you simply would have told them about me? Do you think about that? How many missed opportunities that we miss out on when we don't tell others about Jesus? And it's super easy. But let's put it into another perspective using that same supposition. What if you were walking down the street and a building was on fire, and you're hearing screams come out of that. Are you going to walk by and say, well, I hope somebody calls 911? Think about it. No, we wouldn't do that, would we? Preferably, you'll go in there, you'll get 911. I don't know if you're brave. Maybe you'll go in there and try and rescue people. I don't know. We all don't know what we would do in that situation. But can I tell you something? It's kind of the same thing. There are people itching to know about God. There are people that just simply want to hear about Him. There are people that just, man, they just want to know. And it's really easy. Great glory in his book tells someone, gives us a way. And there's lots of ways, and we talk about it all the time. He calls it the Jesus style, and it's simple. Are you ready? It's just simple dialogue with your friend, a coworker, a family member. It's building a relational bridge first, right? Do you know Jesus? We don't want to say that, right? We want to get to know a person. What do you do for fun? What do you like to do? What kind of movies you watch, right? We build a bridge. Next, he summarizes this way. It's taking time out of your day when you're in line at the store to get to know others. Now, again, in today's time, we're six feet away, right? You can holler at someone, how you doing, Fred? <laughs> we get so caught up in getting in and getting out of the store, don't we? We're focused. What if we just took a moment and just said, how you doing today? You doing all right? You walk off, have a blessed day. You would not believe the implications that does to people when they hear, have a blessed day. We was through the drive through today at McDonald's on the way to church. Nice young men said, have a blessed day. Me and Christy both went, thank you, have a blessed day too, you know? It's a young guy. He's probably 17 years old. Man, he's doing it. He's telling someone, right? Made me happy. It's slowing down to get to know people. I guarantee you, we all our habitual people, right? We go to the same gas station. Maybe sometimes we go every day, get a certain soda or drink. Maybe we go through the drive through We get to know people. It's, it's taking time out of your day to say, you know what, how you doing? You know, have, have you heard about this? Man, I go to this little church down the road. Why don't you come sometime? Better yet, why don't you say this? This is what God did for me. We can do all kinds of different ways of doing it. It's up to you. You got to let the Holy Spirit lead you. The Jesus style is not going about it like I did. The Jesus style is not saying, you think it's hot out today? <laughs> Where you're going, it's really going to be hot, right? 
We don't want to say things like that, do we? That's, that's not how we build that bridge. <laughs> and sometimes maybe that's what they need, Jason. That's right. You never know. I'll let, I'll let the Holy Spirit take care of that. But we, number one, we build a bridge. And let me give you some scripture. This is Paul talking to the church in Corinth. And I've got it on the board and it's in the New Living Translation. This is Paul again. This is the scholar Paul that had the Harvard education of Christianity that walked and saw Jesus. He says, even though I'm a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. Even though, listen to what he says, I'm not subject to that law, I did so that I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. Keep in mind, he says save some. You can't save them all. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessing. Let me say this. We don't save anybody. It's the Holy Spirit that does the saving, right? But we're partakers in that. We have a part in that. And I love what Paul says. He's not changing his mind. He's not living outside of of his faith. He's saying simply, when I'm with this guy, I'm going to build a bridge. When I'm over here, I'm going to build that bridge. It's getting to know somebody. It's taking time out of your busy schedule to get to know them and to find that common ground. Number two, share your testimony. Simply share your testimony. We know what a testimony is, right? It's how good God is, what he's done for you, how amazing it is. And I think if we stop and reflect on every day of our life, we can pick out one thing that God did something amazing in every single day. You woke up, ooh, there's one. You walked to your car, there's two. You got eyes to see, there's three. You see how we can drill into this? You can find something to thank God and to share God, share your testimony with every day. Let me give you some scripture. 2 Timothy 1, 7 and 8. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. And don't be ashamed of me either, even though I, I'm in prison, for, in prison for him. Excuse me. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. Sharing your testimony is not always going to be roses and great reactions, right? Sometimes people are just going to say, okay, that's not for me. And you've got to say, all right, I get it. But here's the great thing. When that person is going through something, they're going to know who to come to to pray. That's what I love about our little church. Someone needs prayer. We are one of the first people they always reach out to because they know we pray. They know if there's a need, we're going to do our best to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We have our little, our little food pantry in there that if someone needs food, they can get food. We, we know that we have a... Um, A benevolence fund. If someone needs something, we're going to try and help them out. Now, you all are so amazing. Most of the time, you all don't even ask. It's people that don't even go to this church that ask. But that's what it's there for. It's to help others. It's not to just talk the talk. It's to walk the walk as well. That makes the difference. Number three, never be ashamed of your testimony. Never, ever, ever be ashamed to share your testimony. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. We should never be ashamed to share with others what God has done for us. Never should we be ashamed. Number four, right before we close, is to pray for boldness. Pray for boldness. Ephesians 6, 19. Again, this is Paul talking to the church in Ephesus. He says, and pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. Stop right there. It's not talking about the mysterious news. It's not what it is. He's talking about the fact that it saves both Jews and Gentiles. And it's the good news. It's so everybody can be saved. There's not one race better than another. Amen? Amen. Val said today as I was talking to her, Jesus died for humankind. And I love it. That's so true. It is. He died for everybody. 
We all should know that, and we all should be bold enough to not be afraid to tell others. As the worship team comes, I, I'd, I'd like to give you a challenge. I also always give a weekly challenge. But before we do, I'm going to ask you something, and, and, and this is where we reflect. When we, when we sing, we all stand, and, and I ask you all to reflect. We have altars if you want to come. We'll lay hands on you and pray for you. But this is what I want you to reflect on. This is the question I have, and it's very serious. Are, well, first off, do you know Jesus as your Savior? Let's just go there. Do you know Christ, or have you made that decision to make Jesus your personal Lord and Savior? Number one, and most importantly. Number two, are you comfortable in your walk with the Lord? Because can I tell you something? If you're comfortable, you shouldn't be. Christianity is uncomfortable. It can be scary, but it's the greatest thing you'll ever do. It is the greatest thing you'll ever do. Sometimes it's easier to be comfortable than it is to sacrifice. Sometimes it's easier to be comfortable than avoid that conversation about Jesus. Sometimes it's easier to be comfortable than it is to be selfless. But can I tell you something? Most of the time, if you're comfortable, you're being selfish. A little harsh, but it's the truth. So here's my challenge before we sing and before we reflect and y'all pray. It's remember that God does not want you to be comfortable. Number two, pray for boldness. Pray that when you wake up every day, God will give you the boldness to have that conversation with someone. Number two, build that bridge. Or number three. And then lastly, and the easiest thing is simply tell someone about Jesus. We've got seven days before we're going to get back together. For those of you that come back, we've got seven days. Here's my challenge. Can I ask that you pray that God will bring one person into your life in seven days that you can just tell them about Jesus? And that's a lot of opportunities that you've got coming your way. Will you pray for that? Whatever you need, I want you to know that we're here. As we sing and we close the service, we're here for you, whatever you need. If you know someone that needs food, let me know. If you know someone that has a need, let us know. It's not me, it's us as a church. It's you, it's all of us together. Let's do something. Let's not just talk the talk. Let's walk the walk together, can we? If you would, let's just stand and reflect as they pray, or as they sing, and then we pray.
just thank you so much. And Lord, we praise you for your son, Jesus. And God, I just thank you so much that each and every one of us can tell someone about your son. Every single one of us here has a testimony. Every single one of us has someone, whether it's through social media, whether it's through work, whether it's at the grocery store or the gas station. We can tell someone just how awesome you are. And Father, that's step number one in our three-step process for discipleship. I ask that you grow us as individuals, that you grow us as a church. Father, that you may be high and lifted up, that you are glorified in everything that we say and do. God, again, we just give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise for everything. We love you. We ask that you be with everything that everyone needs here today, God. We all need something. Whether it's hurt, whether it's a physical ailment, whether it's a financial loss, whatever it is, we need you, God. And the great thing is you can provide those for us. Your will, your way, and your time. We just praise you, God. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Don't forget, next week, 8 o'clock, Saturday, if you're a guy, I'm going to be cool again. Men's D group, it's Men in the Way, 8 o'clock here. And then uh, come back Wednesday. If you can't join us in person, visit us online. Go with God and have a blessed day. We need a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness.